you should be able now, I was putting you. Okay. Hello, do you see my screen? I see the screen. Yes. Okay. Um, so then I let you now. Okay, then presentation mode. Uh, um, see if I can put on my camera. Okay. Uh, not everyone can see me. Um, okay, well, thank you very much, Thomas, for the introduction. Um, so, and yeah, today I would uh, like to talk to you uh, all about uh, 100 million tons. Um, it's to give you an idea how much this is, it's 80,000 Olympic swimming pools or uh, 30 million uh, garbage trucks uh, filled completely. Um, and it's also uh, the amount of uh, urban bio waste and sewage sludge that we are producing in the EU 28 uh, every year. Um, so it's, uh, it's quite a big amount. Um, it's a big amount and it needs to be treated, of course. Um, we cannot just uh, throw it around. Uh, although we did that in the past uh, in the form of landfilling, uh, which was uh, the oldest uh, treatment of this type of waste. Um, then came incineration, uh, as Thais already uh, mentioned before, uh, to uh, recover some energy, um, although not very efficient because uh, organic waste is, 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 is very um, moist, has a high uh, moisture content, high water content. Uh, next step. Um, and the more sustainable treatment of urban bioways was composting, um, where at least we produced um, a fertilizer, a stable fertilizer and soil improver. Uh, so we recovered the nutrients from it. It was also more uh, pure stream. Um, and then now the state of the art of treating this urban bioways is under digestion, uh, where we recover both energy and still produce um, an organic fertilizer. Uh, could be used digest the digest state can be used directly uh, in agricultural soils or it can also be sent to composting um, so this is is what mostly happening now in europe uh, with this urban bio waste um, but we should not stop there and this is where uh, the volatile project uh, comes in view so we need to make a better use of this uh, potential and and move from a linear economy towards a circular economy um, and as thomas already said uh, this is uh, what we built the project around to, to develop a VFA platform uh, to make use um, of this urban bio waste in a, in a more circular uh, way. So I will go quick over this as Thomas already explained it. So we're 21 partners from nine countries uh, with Thomas as the project coordinator and myself as the project technical manager uh, of the project. So who am I uh, or who is OWS? Uh, so we're an SME which was uh, founded already in 1988. Uh, with uh, currently around 100 employees. Um, so we're uh, based in Ghent, but we have affiliates uh, all around uh, the world, even in, uh, in the USA and Japan. Um, so our main um, activity is building anaerobic digestion technology. Um, so as you can see here, it's, it's, a, it's a vertical um, reactor. It's dry anaerobic digestion. So the, the waste is mixed uh, externally um, with, uh, with digestate uh, recycled from the digest which pumped through these um, purple feeding tubes uh, to the top of the reactor um, from where it's then uh, flowing through the digester um, by gravity uh, so the typical flow through rate is, is every two or three days it goes from the top to the bottom then it's mixed again with fresh material and pumped up again uh, so it's a, it's a kind of combination between a plug flow and a, and a mixed reactor, uh, but the mixing, mixing is, is happening externally. So here you see some examples from, from AD plans that we've built um, with, um, with partners also in the, in the volatile project. So although anaerobic digestion is, is quite uh, an interesting technology, uh, it's efficient, it's, it's proven, um, we know what, what to expect from it, we know uh, what, it, what its merits are, um, but in the end, um, still produces a relatively low value output. It, it's, it's biogas, also compost, but yeah, it's, it's still, if you, if you regard that ladder of Lansing, it, it's, it's not scoring very well. Um, and that's why um, in, in view of the Volatile project, uh, we, we, we developed this VFA platform as a next level in sustainable waste uh, treatment. So we, we can discern three steps 
um, in the VFA platform. First of all, it's a production of the VFAs, um, but we also need to extract it. And finally, we, we need to find some, some conversion of these VFAs into the final uh, end products, the target uh, products. So I'll start with the production of VFA. Um, so starting from anaerobic digestion. Um, so this, these are the four uh, steps that we can uh, discern in anaerobic digestion. So we're starting from urban bio wastes. We first have a hydrolysis uh, where we release fatty acids, uh, sugars, some amino acids. And the next step, the acidogenesis, uh, these um, building blocks are further degraded into C3, C6 organic acids mainly, already some 20% goes to acetic acid. And we lose, as we can say it like this, uh, some of the uh, potential as, as hydrogen. Um, the third step is the acetogenesis, uh, where the C366 organic acids are further degraded into mainly acetic acids, but also um, around one third of, of the C366 acids are uh, converted to hydrogen. And then in uh, anaerobic digestion, the final step, the methanogenesis, uh, this acetic acid is converted to uh, methane with the acetoclastic uh, methanogens, but also the hydrogen is, is combined with CO2 uh, by the uh, heterotrophic, uh, the autotrophic uh, methanogens uh, to, um, to build uh, methane from it. So roughly we can say that, that um, two thirds to three fourths are, uh, of the methane is coming from these acetic acid conversion and, and one third to one quarter is, is coming from uh, the hydrogen that is converted. So now if you want to, to take this uh, process step and we want to focus uh, or to bring it to um, a volatile fatty acid platform, then we need to, to shut down this, this final step. Uh, and if we are able to do this, then we will have to uh, automatically see a buildup of these uh, C2 to C6 uh, organic acids and of course the hydrogen, which we cannot um, eliminate uh, as being produced. So um, in the volatile project, uh, first of all, we started by determining the biogas potential because as, as I just uh, shown you, um, the, the processes are very similar. So the biogas potential could give a good estimate of, of what to expect. Uh, so we um, did over 60 um, different uh, waste samples that we've collected uh, during the project, all analyzed them. And here we, we categorize them in, in wastewater treatment plant sludge, uh, the mechanical, mechanically separated bio waste, uh, then separately collected uh, bio waste and separately collected food waste. And we see that, that there's a clear trend uh, going from uh, the wastewater treatment sludge flowing the, the lowest biogas potential um, towards the, the, the food waste that's separately collected showing the, the highest uh, potential. Um, the black triangle is the average value. The, the green bar gives the, the um, the variability of the different samples. Uh, so you see also the food waste, it's on average the highest, but it's highly variable. So we see with the separately collected bio waste is doing more or less uh, similar. So as the next step, we um, uh, we um, avoided the methane production um, and we, we use the same samples to, to see if we can see a similar trend. And this is what came out of it. So you see um, it's, it's very similar. We have the same um, evolution with wastewater treatment plant sludge still having the lowest um, PFA potential and the food waste uh, showing the highest uh, potential. Um, this is a huge advantage because there are a lot of information available um, in, in, in literature and uh, in the internet um, on, on the biogas potential of these type of waste streams and, and we know now that the biogas potential is the first good indication of, of what we should expect uh, from the volatile fatty acid potential. So we don't have to start completely from scratch, we can already use what's, what's been collected and, and produced over the last over the last decades and, and use it as a starting point to make a first selection of, of which streams are most suitable for the VFA platform. Um, an important thing that we uh, observed during the project is that the type of bio waste more or less determines the VFA spectrum uh, that we can obtain. Uh, so in this graph you see again the, the yellow circles are uh, the, the, the volatile fatty acid yield um, expressed as, as gram of COD per kilogram of organic matter of the waste. Uh, the black uh, square is uh, the biogas potential, also expect as, expect, expressed as uh, COD per kilogram organic matter. And then you see the average um, spectrum. So regardless of the type of waste, acetic acid seems to be uh, the most important parameter in it, uh, or the most important component in it. Uh, but then you see some, some differences, especially in the sludges, you see that uh, these are the isoforms um, iso of uh, isobutyric, isocoproic, isovaleric acid. 
and these are mostly found in the sludge uh, samples. We have some traces in in the uh, in the other bioway samples, um, but but um, less pronounced. Um, also, um, butyric acid and propionic acids are are important uh, important building uh, factors in it. And in the food waste, we see that you have a higher share of C6 uh, caproic acid, which which is interesting because that that's uh, um, yeah the the higher the carbon count and the acid, the the the, the higher the value um, of the of the of the of the VFA mixture. Um, <clears throat> as you already could see, so you see the the yellow circles are always lower uh, than the than the square. So the VFA yield is always lower uh, than the methane yield, and Again, this comes from from this figure. We see that it's it's unavoidable because um, during the conversion of of the bioways to the acetic acids, some of it is lost as hydrogen, and this can, this hydrogen can be recovered as methane, but it cannot be uh, recovered as as volatile fatty acids. There's this, a small amount um, that can go to acetic acid, but it's 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 actually it's uh, um, yeah it's it's very marginal compared to uh, to what uh, what is produced as, as methane. So we have to, um, to find a way to, um, yeah, to make use of this now hydrogen loss. And we found that uh, we can perfectly combine volatile fatty acid and biogas production. Uh, so in this uh, test that we performed, we, we started again from the urban bioway to the pretreatment. And around 35% of the, the, uh, the, um, the dry matter of the urban bioway was sent to the volatile fatty acid fermentation. And the remaining 65% was sent to anaerobic digestion. So, um, with this approach, we, we succeeded um, in producing 50-50 uh, between volatile fatty acids and methane production. So, despite there's only one third of the organic matter sent through the volatile fatty acid fermentation, we were able to produce uh, recover half of, of the total yield as, as volatile fatty acid, which is which is very promising. Um, and also, it's a good thing that, that we produce, still produce these methane because yeah, volatile fatty acid production also requires some, some energy. You need pumps, uh, you need heating. Uh, so by, by combining it with anaerobic digestion, you are able to produce uh, your own energy demand uh, from the waste material itself. Um, <clears throat> so this is another approach that we take. So we have the biogas potential of the pure bio waste. So this is the maximum um, that we can obtain from uh, bio waste using these these uh, biological conversion. If you use the same, um, let's say we, we use one kilogram, and this is the amount of biogas that we can produce from it, expressed as as uh, chemical oxygen demand. If you use the same um, same kilogram of waste and we use it for volatile fatty acid production, then we only have 52% of this yield, so, so that's a loss. But if we combine it. Um, with uh, this pretreatment that I, I discussed before, so with 35% is able to uh, produce 93% of the maximum volatile fatty acid yields. And the remaining material can be sent to anaerobic digestion. So all in all, we have more or less the same yield, total yield um, with the combined volatile fatty acid and biogas production as you would have done with digesting it directly, converting it directly to anaerobic digestion. Um, so, but now we have 50% of our end product is, is, is a chemical building block, uh, which on the ladder of Lansing has a much higher score and we, and we can use it in a circular economy whilst uh, still producing energy. But of course, yeah, it's, it's still um, 50%. So um, one of our targets in, in follow-up projects will be to, to further increase these VFA yields uh, by, by using other um, uh, pretreatment um, scenarios, and of course the idea is to to increase this and and, and only have 28% of um, biogas and and increase it to to 72% to of volatile fatty acids, which is the theoretical maximum. So we want to to get as close to that as possible, um, as these 28% should still be enough to to uh, to fulfill the the uh, the own energy demand. Um, so. Um, as an example of increasing the VFA yield, uh, we did a few tests on the sewage sludge because this had uh, the lowest VFA yield, so probably the, the highest um, increases were to be expected uh, from this material. And then we applied the heat pressure treatment of the sewage sludge, and, and here you can see um, two, two tests that we did, but untreated scoring 
very low uh, on, on the VFA yield. Uh, but after the treatment, you see that we have uh, quite a, a substantial increase um, of, of this VFA yield. And, and actually, with this pretreatment, we, we already reached um, the levels that we were obtaining in, in some of the, um, the other bio-waste uh, samples. Um, another important factor that, that we are uh, further investigating in follow-up projects uh, will be to, to customize the volatile fatty acid spectrum. Um, so now we see that if we, if we don't do anything, the spectrum is, is um, determined um, by the, the, the composition of the bio-waste. Um, so the approach will be to, to um, optimize the process parameters so that we are able to, to produce custom-made uh, compositions uh, which are optimally suited uh, for uh, secondary fermentations, for example, for PHA production um, or for other uh, types of, uh, of uh, fermentations. Um, another challenge will, of course, be to suppress methanogens, um, as methanogens uh, are, are very, uh, very hardy uh, organisms and, and very uh, difficult to get rid of. Uh, it's, so it's an important uh, aspect to, to yeah, avoid methane being produced because that means that uh, the volatile fatty acids are converted uh, to methane and, and we lose them. So here we see some examples. So for a, a separately collected uh, household waste, to see that these uh, losses as methane are, are quite low. Um, so they're below uh, 10 grams of COD per kilogram PS compared to, uh, let's say, for the VFA yield uh, for this material are around 300 to 500 uh, grams of um, COD per kilogram per year, so it's, it's a marginal loss. If we look at food waste, uh, most of them also do good, but some of them have already uh, 20 grams of COD losses uh, per kilogram of organic matter. Uh, but again, here we had a higher VFA yield as well, so here we had uh, up to, to 600, 700 uh, grams of kilo, uh, CO2 per uh, kilogram VS, so still it's, it's marginal compared uh, to the VFA yield. Uh, but a total different um, story it is for the sewage sludge, um, where we, here you can see we had up to 80 grams of CO2 as methane that was lost per kilogram of organic matter, um, and this is should be compared to yeah, 150 to maximum 250 grams of COD per kilogram organic matter as volatile fatty acid yield. So here it's not, not a marginal problem anymore. It's, it's, it's one third of, of the yield that is lost as methane during the VFA production. Um, so again, uh, we try to heat pressure treatment to see if this also helps on uh, suppressing uh, methanogens. And uh, as you can see from this graph, it did. Uh, so these, these two lines are without any treatment. And here you see from this sample, from the beginning, we almost had an anaerobic digester here after three, four days, uh, methane uh, began to be produced. Whereas after the treatment, we noticed that only after eight days, methane started being produced. And um, we also noticed via vapor production, the optimal residence time is around four to seven days. So um, at that, between four and seven days, you reach the maximum uh, VFA yield. After that, it's, it's not much use to prolong the test anymore. So, which is very good news because here we see that methane production only starts after we already have reached our maximum PFA yield. So, if we stop the process in time, we still have the maximum PFA yield and we have avoided uh, methane production. Um, as um, Thais already mentioned shortly, uh, we did not only use did lab tests, we also did some uh, pilot scale. Um, and um, we had uh, very promising results, as you see, the, the green. Um, bar is um, the yield that we reached at lab scale. The blue one is what we reached as at uh, pilot scale. So they are uh, in the same range. Here you see that the red um, error bar is, is the, the, the variation that we had on the different tests that we performed. You see that, that the range is, is, is more or less in the same, uh, same range. So this is very promising also at uh, TRL5 level. Uh, so it's a five uh, cubic meter reactor that we use for that. We have the same yields as we uh, had in the lab. So now we have produced them, uh, brings us to the, the second uh, step in the VFA uh, production, it's the extraction of VFAs. Uh, so uh, compared to anaerobic digestion, it, it's where it's very easy, the methane uh, spontaneously bubbles out of the reactor medium, but uh, here the volatile fatty acids are in, in solution in the medium. Uh, so we have to, to use a, a way to uh, extract them. Um, in the volatile project, we used um, membrane extraction, um, where we used a cascade approach to um, 
get a, end up with a concentrated VFA block, which is free of impurities, and, and by using different membranes, the biomass and degraded organics or macromolecules and salts are retained in, uh, in the process water fraction. So I say we used a cascade approach, uh, meaning microfiltration, ultrafiltration, nanofiltration to purify uh, the, uh, the VFA broth. And then finally, we used reverse osmosis uh, to remove water and end up with a higher concentration of volatile fatty acids so that uh, if you need to transport the material, uh, you need to transport less water. Also, a concentrated uh, VFA um, substrate is more ideal to, to feed fat batch reactors, for example. So these are the type of... Uh, tubular membranes that we used. Um, here you can see that uh, we started from uh, a very brownish uh, VFA rich digest state and throughout uh, the purification we ended up with a, a very clear uh, permeate after nanofiltration. Um, in the lab we also uh, not only focused on, on um, reverse osmosis but we also did some uh, rotary evaporator uh, tests where we also had, had very uh, promising results. So uh, depending on, on where the, the, the test site is located, if, if there's some, some cheap uh, waste heat available, uh, this evaporation could also be a very interesting uh, means of, of concentrating uh, the volatile fatty acids. And also, uh, we did not only produce the VFAs at pilot scale, we also uh, tried to purify them uh, at the trans facility. So here you can see that uh, we succeeded well. We started up with a very... Uh, yeah turbulent, viscous um, outputs of the CSCR reactor, and we ended up with a very clear um, um, nanofiltration uh, permeate. And uh, in the end, we were able to uh, concentrate uh, up to six times um, the, uh, uh, the VFA concentration in the reverse osmosis. Um, and you also see from, from this uh, graph uh, at the right bottom that also, of course, uh, the electric conductivity, the salt content, increased in the reverse osmosis uh, retentate, uh, but it's absent in the permeate, which is very uh, promising because this, this reverse osmosis permeate uh, will be reused in the process as process water. So it's very good that there are very little uh, salt in here, so that it will not uh, impact uh, the VFA production process. Um, so we have produced the volatile fatty acids, we have extracted them, we have a VFA-rich uh, medium, um, now we need to convert them to uh, some um, high high value, high quality end product. And in the volatile project, uh, we used the uh, three approaches, which is using a biopolyester, uh, producing a single cell oil, and producing omega-3 fatty acids. Um, I will not go in, <clears throat> in much detail here because uh, the, the next three presentations uh, will, will provide you all the, the information uh, you need on, on these uh, conversion steps. Um, and um, <clears throat> for me, I will go back to uh, my first slides, which is 100 million tons of urban bio waste, um, which, uh, as you can see in the Volatile uh, project, we have now turned into a valuable uh, resource. Um, <clears throat> a rough calculation is that from these 100 million tons, we can produce around 7 to 10 million tons of volatile fatty acids, which in turn could be uh, converted to 3 to 4 uh, million tons of uh, these. Um, these end products. So if there are any questions, uh, you can ask them now or uh, with this slide, you have my uh, contact details. If you uh, come up with a question later on, uh, don't hesitate to contact me. Thank you. And if there's questions, let's go ahead. Thank you, Philip. Thank you very much. Um, yeah. Um, <coughs> uh, we, we, we have, as, as, as we discussed, it, as we had already some of the questions before, let's start uh, uh, with the, the question from Lawrence. Um, he asked um, how much we need to be produced per ton of input material. Maybe that was answered also with your last slide. Uh, uh, Philip, can you maybe short uh, go back to this? <coughs> This, uh, 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 Lawrence was just answering that, that it's okay. Yeah, he has uh, information. Then okay, yeah, they're very much from, of course, your, the, the dry matter content um, and, and the type of waste. But uh, um, yeah, roughly you can say for, for bio waste, um, the higher the purity, the higher the yield, of course, will be uh, for the, the best food waste substrates. Uh, we are able to produce um, 
per, per kilogram of organic matter, about half of it can be recovered as volatile fatty acids. Uh, for more um, heterogeneous waste, it, it, it decreases to, let's say, 250, 350 um, grams per kilogram of organic matter. So this, this order of magnitudes. Okay, thanks. And then uh, Samson asked uh, up to what level uh, was the VFE concentrated with the membrane? Um, we had yeah, five, five to six times. Uh, that's what we reached. But of course, yeah, it's it's, uh, it's in progress. So we hope to to be able in, in, in follow up projects to uh, to further increase these uh, this concentration factor. Because the concentration has a, a, a it's a critical step for the for the later for the exploitation. Yeah, and the target is to, to reach 200 to 300 uh, grams per liter uh, in, in the after concentration. But okay, we have to see so what's possible. We we'll also depend on the salt content, of course. Uh, which is then uh, determined by the input composition. Uh, so it might differ a bit from, from stream to stream, but that, that, that's what we aim for. Okay. Uh, so then, um, and then there's a question from um, um, from Paco Caparos. He asked a very nice presentation. Did you evaluate other alternatives for extraction, recovery, purification? Uh, what are the main impurities in the final product? Thanks. Uh, well, fine. Yeah, the, 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 the main impurities uh, are, of course, um, the biomass, the bacteria that, that converted the, uh, the volatile fatty acids, um, and some residual organic matter. So this is mostly removed uh, by centrifuging. So then we have the, the, the most uh, material removed. Um, and then the, the yeah, ultrafiltration and nanofiltration was, was used to, to uh, to extract macromolecules um, and, and also some, some salts so that at the end you end up with a, a product that is mostly um, volatile fatty acids and as little other components as, as possible. Um, and as already briefly mentioned, uh, the reverse osmosis could be replaced by evaporation, but uh, from an economical viewpoint, this is, is feasible, I think, if, if there is a, a cheap waste source available near sites. Um, otherwise, I think the reverse osmosis is the is the most uh, logical way to uh, to approach this to, to go for it. Yeah, that's that's what we discussed also. That okay, you are depending on as we have eight different uh, test cases. At the Twenza side, they have waste heat as they have the incineration. But uh, in other cases, if you have only the bio waste treatment, then uh, uh, other options would be a little, a little bit more limited. So the reverse osmosis would be the most uh, best way. Uh, and then. Um, Laurens is asking, are the units in the presented graph correct, Philip? Uh, which? Laurens, can you give us an indication which graph do you mean? From pilot scale to the lab, uh, to lab scale, or from lab scale to pilot scale, I suppose. Yeah. Uh, this one, then, I suppose. It's uh... a. Yeah. Ah. Oh, no, it's, it's his gram, sorry. It's correct. It's you are gram, correct. Th thanks a lot. It's gram. It's gram. Thanks. Thanks. Um, okay. Then uh, Anika Putz is asking, did you also try the combination of different feedstocks for VFA production? Um, but actually, the, 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 the bio waste I collect is already quite quite some mixture um but but yes if you combine them you you see an influence on on the composition so um so this is also some of the follow-ups that that's uh, also what uh you what I, um, as i mentioned here uh, so there's two approaches that we take it's, it's the process parameters and it's also combining feedstocks to get to end up with um, um a composition that that's perfectly suited for for one or another um, secondary fermentation Okay. It's a bit the same approach as we use with anaerobic digestion, where you also combine uh, feedstocks to end up with uh, an optimal optimal mixture. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks, Philip. And then there, you have a lot of questions. Great. <laughs> um, now comes now comes the very critical ones because I remember we discussed that also during the the the, the project. A certain point. Thanks for your nice presentation. What was the pH during the fermentation? um we used different ph but mostly um it was between 5 and 6.5 uh, that that was a 
the rings that we mostly use. So it's a bit of a, a trade-off. Um, more neutral pH is, is, is higher productivity, uh, but also you are more prone to, uh, to methane uh, production. Um, if you go lower um, on, on the pH, um, methanes, uh, methanogens are suppressed better, but yeah, also the, the, the conversion speed is a little bit lower. So it's, it's, mm. it's working at the, as high pH as possible without um, getting methane production. And it's also influencing somehow um, the, the VFA spectrum. So it, it can also be used as, as steering it towards uh, one or another um, uh, component in it. But again, yeah, the lower the pH, the lower the, 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 the conversion speed will be. So it might be that, that also some trade-off between do I really want this composition, but it takes me two times as long to produce it, or do I go for another composition where I have it in, in half the time and also half the reactor content. So it's uh, it's a lot of factors that have to be taken into account. Mm -hmm. uh, then, uh, did you succeed to totally inhibit methanogenesis? Um, for a certain period, yes, but it's 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 difficult. Uh, sometimes you have to uh, um, do some pH shock or or go very low in in residence time to to again, yeah, flush these methane uh, producers out of it. So it's it's. It will be a constant working point to uh, to work towards as high yields as possible, um, and sometimes you have to to apply some har more harsh conditions uh, to avoid methane productions. You can of your, of course uh, apply chemicals, but uh, yeah, that's not a very sustainable uh, solution. Okay, thanks. You have another question, uh, uh, Philip, from Lawrence Willis uh, again. How much input water do you use per ton input material? Are you recycling water? Um, so yeah, recycling water, sure. That, that sort of I said, the, the reverse osmosis um, permeate uh, will be used again. Um, yeah, we want to work. Yeah, the amount of water we use, of course, depends on on uh, the, the dry matter content of, of the organic waste. And for some 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 uh, food waste, it's not necessary to use water because it's it's perfectly mixable, pumpable. Um, but but this is the main constraint. It has to be pumpable and mixable. Um, so we we try we aim for um, yeah, dry matter content of the input uh, between eight and and fifteen percent. Uh, that seems uh, ideal uh, to uh, to convert uh, uh, to volatile fatty acids. Mm -hmm. uh, thanks. Um, okay. So, are there any more questions? Otherwise, you can also ask them later on. Uh, Philip will stay here the, the whole day as he has to be in the round table, so he can also answer later uh, questions. Um, then, thanks a lot, Philip. You're welcome, so, thank you. And, and then we will move on now to the production of biopolyesters from waste. Um, uh, presented by Bruno. Bruno is the CEO of, um, he's already there. Hi, good Hi Bruno. Hi. Um, Philip, switch off the camera. 